<sighs> Never would have thought podcasting would land me in jail. I never got why they called it the slammer. Until now. Ugh. What a predicament. Welcome to What a Predicament. It's a podcast that peers into some of the predicaments of the modern day and age and strives to shed some light on the hard and not so hard hitting issues alike. My name is Alex Bain and if you've been keeping up with the podcast, you'll know that I'm recording this from jail. I've been here for about a week now and while they say you can't keep a good man down, apparently it's pretty easy to keep bad men down. You know, they beat you up if you try to escape. Now, I'll let you in on a little something. I do have a plan to break on out of here, and I'll let you in on that a little later on in the podcast. But firstly, I want to get into this week's predicament. While we're on the topic of crime, I'm going to take a look into New Zealand's role in the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy. What role, I hear you ask? Well, I too had no idea little old Aotearoa was caught up in the whirlwind of conspiracy, but it has come to my attention that there is some speculation out there that my home country of New Zealand is in fact implicated. Now, there are a million other podcasts and documentaries that cover the events of that fateful day, and I myself am by no means an expert, just a disclaimer here. There are people who have spent decades and decades trying to piece together what may or may not have really happened and you could probably get a more detailed, accurate picture somewhere else. I, in this episode of What a Predicament, really just want to find out how the land of the long white cloud factors into things. But before I get into New Zealand's role in the whole sordid affair, I will just quickly recap the very basics of the assassination. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, commonly known as JFK or Fitzy, was elected president of the United States of America in the year 1960. He was the dude that famously said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. It was during his presidency that the US began its military involvement in Vietnam, a conflict that was really starting to ramp up in the year 1963, the year President Kennedy was shot and killed on the 22nd of November in Dallas, Texas. The official story is that the man who pulled the trigger was one Lee Harvey Oswald, who fired from a high window of the book depository he was working at as the president's parade was passing in the street below. Oswald himself was captured later that same day. Two days later, as he was being moved by police, a local nightclub owner and shady underworld figure named Jack Ruby shot and killed Lee Harvey Oswald. So you'd think that'd nicely wrap things up in a tidy, gunpowdery loop, but it turns out that's just where the conspiracy theories begin. The House of Representatives Select Committee on Assassination's official position after their investigation was that while they don't believe any of the conspiracies floating around at the time of their final report, they did say that they believed Kennedy was killed as part of a conspiracy. Possibly one reaching as far as the South Pacific? Like many other people, my interest in the assassination was piqued after seeing the Oliver Stone film JFK, though probably not for the same reasons as everyone else. If you've seen it, you might remember the one famous scene where DA Jim Garrison meets up with Mr. X to get the skinny on the conspiracy. Because when you need an informant to spill the beans, you can trust X gonna give it to you. In the movie, Mr. X had been working with the president on plans for a full evacuation of Vietnam, only to have those plans undermined by the powers that be when he was sent on a mission to Antarctica, that icy hellhole of the South Pacific. On his way back stateside, he made a pit stop in Christchurch, the garden city of New Zealand, jewel of the South Pacific, and was shaken to his very core upon reading a copy of local newspaper The Star, which announced not only the president's death, but broke the news of Lee Harvey Oswald's arrest. Now, in the film, he alleges that Oswald was charged for the murder of the president at 7pm Texas time, which works out to be 2pm the next day, New Zealand time. 
in this copy of The Star, on the front page, was an extensively researched profile on Oswald, covering his military history, his family, and he wonders how The Star could have already got all that background information on this previously unknown nutter, hours before the same information became known in the United States. As a black ops operative, ops means operative, so just a black operative, blacks, ops, as a black ops operative, X could smell a cover story a mile away, or 1.6 kilometers away, being in New Zealand. See, had his character been in Texas, instead of being shipped off to the South Pole by the conspirators, he would have been the guy to secure all the security in Dallas during that fateful trip, and assures Jim Garrison that the shooting would have never happened under his watch, damn it. The facts, as presented in the film JFK, have been widely criticised as inaccurate. But where did this story about a New Zealand newspaper come from? Was it completely made up for the film? Or was there a real Kiwi rag that inspired these dramatic allegations? By golly, I just had to find out. So, where to start? This was going to be one of my trickiest predicaments yet. I thought, how about with the newspaper itself? Thanks to the internet, I was able to find a digitised archive of that very issue and can confirm that the front page of the Christchurch Star on the 23rd of November 1963 did read thusly. Kennedy shot dead, gunned down during drive through Dallas. President Kennedy was assassinated today. The president was shot as he drove through this Texas city in an open car. Police have arrested a man employed at the building where a rifle was found after President Kennedy's assassination, British United Press reported. The man, reported to be married to a Russian, shot dead a police officer as he was chased into a Dallas cinema. The Associated Press of America named the man as Lee H. Oswald, age 24. So at least that part is true. There was a Christchurch paper that ran the story of the assassination and a profile on Oswald on the date alleged by the movie. But who is this Mr. X? This is where the plot thickens. Mr. X was based on a real-life guy who really made these and more allegations about the murder and cover-up of JFK by the CIA in order to stop his interference in the Vietnam War, which they allegedly weren't quite ready to wrap up at the time. Colonel Fletcher Prouty wrote in his book The Guns of Dallas... I happened to be far away in New Zealand at the time of JFK's murder. I was on my way to breakfast with a member of Congress from Ohio. As soon as possible, we purchased the first newspaper available, the Christchurch Star. It is amazing to reread the front page of that paper today and find all of the detail, the remarkable detail about Lee Harvey Oswald, about his service in the Marine Corps, about his living in Russia, about his Russian wife, and then the full scenario of the crime. Then one begins to wonder, understanding full well the capability of modern day communications and reporting, who it was that was able in so short a time to come up with such a life history of so obscure a 24 year old loner? Who fabricated all of that news? Who was at the right place at that moment to flood the whole world with all of this news about Lee Harvey Oswald when even the Dallas police weren't too sure of their man, they said, because he carried two identities, Oswald and Alec Hiddle, in his pocket. Colonel Prouty's predicament was how a newspaper on the other side of the world would be able to get together and publish such precise details about Lee Harvey Oswald at the pace and technological limitations of the 1960s. All of this information was right there on the cover of the Star a full four hours before Oswald was convicted of assassinating the president. The conspiracy goes that the CIA had pre-packaged details on Oswald and sent them to newspapers worldwide to frame him. But there's no way New Zealand would take part in no stick-up job, would they? To make some sense of all this, I spoke to... Barry Clark. The editor-in-chief of the Star who just might be able to answer my pertinent questions. Why did you kill JFK? What, why did who? I'm just thinking it must have been someone from the start, uh, but oh, apparently I not. Oh, I see what you mean. Oh, right, just, just, to get, just, to get that, just to get the world scoop on the front page, you reckon? Yeah, well, I thought I might catch you out. <laughs> oh, no, no, Alex, I was, uh, I was um, yeah, no, 
I don't know. Who knows? There might be there might be someone who's retired, sitting in a suburban Christchurch chamber, worked at the Star. Who who, who knows knows everything? Who knows? But I but I but I very much very much doubt it. So uh, how often do you get calls about uh, this sort of thing about the whole conspiracy? Very uh, very rarely, Alex. Uh, the last one I think was a. Uh, a TVNZ news crew came into the office uh, probably about a year ago uh, and uh, you know, looked for the front page and, and so on and so on. They were doing something on it, so very rare. And would it be people from all over the world? Who uh, contact us? No, yeah. no I, we haven't had anybody contact us about this probably since the, uh, the movie, uh, basically, uh, back in when 1992, um, when it got a lot of publicity and... There was quite a, uh, you know, quite a lot of international interest at the time. I, I wasn't here then, uh, but certainly um, uh, there was a lot of interest in it when the uh, when the movie came out. And Assassin says what? Did you see the movie yourself? I have, yeah, I saw the movie, and um, I think quite a bit of Hollywood license in there, uh, Alex, in terms of the fact that uh, you know the Christchurch star was implicated in a conspiracy. A number of years ago, Bob Cotton, who was a reporter at the paper at the time and uh, then went on to be a chief reporter, since uh, retired, um, uh, Bob has uh, some, had some very deep views on it, and um, a lot of things didn't add up with what was in the movie in terms of when the paper was produced and, and so on. And um, and even way back in 1963, news did get through very quickly. Um, age of the computer now. Uh, so things are, are pretty instant, but things were very, very quick back then. And um, uh, wire services were able to, to feed stories quickly. It was, it was known very quickly um, uh, that uh, Harvey Oswald, Lee Harvey Oswald would have been arrested and uh, there was a lot of background stuff on him at the time in the file, so stories were able to, put, to be put together very, very quickly. And that was, that was Bob's uh, uh, theory at the time and I think a very good one. Is it, so no one from the, uh, who was there at the time is still at the star? No, not at all, uh, Alex. It was what nineteen sixty-three, so they'd be uh, they'd be well and truly uh, uh, well and true. Well, actually, no, they wouldn't be. They're all no, they're all gone now. They're all retired or uh, have gone to the great uh, newsroom in the sky. <laughs> Is it? Do you find it sort of annoying the? Uh incorrectness as portrayed in the movie or is it kind of cool that a, a relatively small weekly publication like the Christchurch Star has talked about the world over? Um, no, it's not annoying at all really and um, I mean the Christchurch Star at the time was a very strong powerful daily newspaper um, but like the Auckland Star basically and um, they were probably the two most prominent daily newspapers in the country. So at that time it was, uh, and even, yeah, well, at the time it was a, you know, it was a, a big paper. Um, yeah, no, we're not such a week, small weekly anyway, I suppose. Our, our readership's grown by 18% in the last uh, last audit. But um, no, not at all. I mean, um, I suppose it's flattering in a way that people, some people will see that the star was implicated in a, in a, in a conspiracy in regards to the um, to the JFK uh, assassination, but, but we certainly don't see it that way. So just with your knowledge of it, and I realise you're coming in a bit later, but from what you hear around the office, what was the conspiracy as, as far as you understand it? Well, from what I understand, and uh, not, probably, not, probably not hearing it around the office, but there's nobody here at the time, but, um, but talking with Bob, when, when Bob was, when I came on board, Bob was just going. But um, yeah, I guess the conspiracy was that the information was sent out effectively um, what, before the assassination, uh, I guess, and to hit um, to hit certain time frames for newspapers, particularly in the the time frame that um, that we came out in. But according to Bob Cotton, um, the movie even got the production times wrong uh, for the paper. According to him, uh, the paper couldn't have been published and wouldn't have been published until one thirty or two fifteen or two thirty p.m. Um, depending on the edition of the afternoon. So the hours didn't tally as well. But as I say, it was a very good, very good, um, a bit of Hollywood license or a lot of Hollywood license. Well, of course, who knows? Who knows, Alex? Yeah. Do Do you think there's no no slim chance someone someone from the star was in on the whole thing? Uh, I well. Who knows? There might have been a, uh, a CIA agent or, or whatever planted in the star. Who knows? I, 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 I sincerely doubt it. Um, I just think it was, uh, you know, as I say, um, the star was a very, very good daily newspaper back then and um, basically 
when the assassination occurred and uh, it started to splash around the world, the journos at the start would have been able to put together stuff extraordinarily quickly. They were, they were a very, very ta- talented team of, uh, of, of journalists and um, a very strong, hard newsman and woman, and uh, they, they would have got that front page together very quickly. So, you know, I guess from a, from a Christchurch star point of view, sure, I wouldn't say I put the star on the map or anything like that, but um, I guess it's quite flattering to see the, the star mast head up in a, in a Hollywood movie and, and so on and uh, whatever, but, um, you know, as I say, looking at Bob Cotton, um, who was chief reporter, uh, or reporter on the paper back then and, and a subsequent chief reporter, um, said um, there was no um, uh, star... Uh, a conspiracy uh, wasn't set up or anything like that, and it simply was just very good, um, quick journalism when when the assassination happened to um, to pull the front page together. So it's not even really just a case of a guy got his wires crossed about the times things were published, as much as they pretty much made it up for the film. Uh, well, I, I mean, I couldn't say if they made it up for the film. I don't know, but um, but it certainly um, it certainly adds uh, adds a, a, a nice twist to a to a uh, to a movie, doesn't it? Uh, Second Gummin says what? Huh. I suspect perhaps maybe the Christchurch Star had nothing to do with the murder after all. If they had, then I think the old assassin says what would have caught him out. So you know what? I believe him. It looks like the conspiracy theorists who would implicate New Zealand did not realise a number of things. Firstly, Oswald was not such an unknown entity. He'd previously got a lot of attention over his fair play for Cuba campaign. Newspapers had also already written about his defection to and return from the Soviet Union, which is big news for a former US Marine during the Red Scare. Newspapers keep biographical info like that stored away in files called morgue files. That way, when these people of note crop up again, all of the information could be easily pulled up and transmitted around the world by way of the teleprinter. And of course, because the assassination of the leader of the free world is fairly big news, editors at the Star worked at breakneck speed to try and get that issue together. Bob Cotton, who Barry mentioned in our conversation, is a former chief reporter at the Star who worked for the publication at the time that all this went down. His version of events is that Oswald was taken into custody at 8.50am New Zealand time. The international press knew of Oswald's being in custody by 10am and could start pulling up all those morgue files and dishing all the dirt. Now Colonel Prouty had assumed it was a morning paper but the Christchurch Star was published in the early afternoon. Bob recalls that even in 1963, well before 4G, global communication was fast and effective. The paper would have been published around 1.30, 2.15pm, plenty of time to plaster Lee Harvey Oswald's mug on the front page. Put simply, to counter Colonel Prouty's claims that the star couldn't possibly have all that information when they did, it seems like, yeah they could. Good old New Zealand reporters, eh? And that was then, with early 60s technology. Just think, with today's technology, how quick a Kiwi could have a podcast episode up about the assassin. Could have been the greatest episode of What a Predicament Ever. Instead of this one, which is like a C plus, B minus, B. Let me know by rating and reviewing on iTunes. Anyway, now, when the glorious nation of New Zealand is mentioned by one of your conspiracy nut mates, you can shut them down and say, hey, get out of it. Who the real assassin was, who helped them, and how many bullets they used to do it has been the topic of much discussion over the last 52 and a half years, and I don't honestly know who did it, but I feel confident now that it wasn't the country of New Zealand. However, to this day, the CIA still has not declassified some of the documents related to the assassination. The statute of limitations on those documents are up next year, and they're set to be declassified. So... Unless whichever new president the US gets stuck with decides to veto their release, we might all finally know the truth as soon as next year. But until then... Thanks this week to Barry Clark and John Martin. The opening theme music for What a Predicament is a derivative of The Little Hotel of Horrors by Decumentarium, licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 4.0. Stay up to date with breaking What A Predicament news by following facebook.com slash 
What a predicament. Check us a like. I'll keep you posted with links to stream episodes right from your browser whenever each new episode comes out. In fact, every previous episode is already up there now, as well as being available wherever you found this one, I guess, including, nay, especially at the official website whatacat.co.nz. Why What A Cat? Well, this podcast is a What A Cat production. Thank you for finding this. Thank you for listening this far through. Thank you for putting up with all the social media plugs. So, anyway, this plan to break out of this joint I mentioned earlier. Behind this poster in my cell wall, I have... Aha! It's a hole I've been digging away at for the last week. It should lead me right through the sewer system and out into freedom. So it's not the most original method of escape, but it worked for Andy Dufresne. So, if it ain't broke... Okay, here I go. Ah, uh, yuck, it stinks in here. Ugh. All of this excrement is a fitting metaphor for how I'm busting out from inside of the belly of this jail. Oh, now, as of right now, if the smell is anything to go by, I should be directly over the septic tank. Now, if I just get a little... Right, what? Uh, well, that was an unexpected turn of events. I'm out of the jail now, so that's a plus. But I think I've got myself directly flush out into the giant communal septic tank. So that's a definite minus. Ah, uh, shit.